when you were on the road with them in the beginning, what was it like being on the road with the with the Ramones? Well, it was uh, you know it, it was an adventure because at the time uh, all of this territory was uncharted as far as punk rock went. You know, nobody really knew what was going on when they'd see these guys. Um, so it was we were never quite sure how we were going to be received when we went to some of these smaller towns. You know. And uh, the Ramones would set up in, uh, in, in some bar, and, uh, and and depending on the crowd, you know, they might be still shouting out for Freebird, <laughs> you know. <laughs> and then the Ramones would say, I mean, there's one story in the book about how that we were playing, doing a show in Connecticut. Yeah, so. yeah, I got up to that, because I used to go to the club all the time. Oh, you so know I, Oh, yeah, I know Toads very well, and then the other surrounding clubs... In Connecticut, so Toes was, was always okay because you had they a, immortalized you know, them over there. Like as soon as you walk in, there's a big fucking mural of all four of them. Toes still there? Toes is still there. Yeah, it is. Wow. Yeah, man. it's still yeah. a dump. <laughs> well, it wasn't that bad a dump, really. I mean, we <laughs> maybe it should have seen some of the real age, dumps, man. Yeah, that, you know, it hasn't aged gracefully. I'll tell it, you had a, it had a dressing room that you know, wow. um, that wasn't the bathroom. I mean, it actually had a dressing room for the bands at okay. least, you know. Which, yeah, because I remember but like that was a luxury for us at the time. Oh, wow, yeah. it's just so unbelievable, though. You know, you hear about some of these venues. Because I mean, as I'm reading the book, because I'm on there now, and I'm just laughing because of the place that you're mentioning. I'm like, oh, I've been there. You know, I lived in Connecticut for a little while, so uh, right. it's just so interesting. Because I also, you know, in the in not to stray away from the book, but also in the documentary uh, end of the century, I, I believe it's you that says it that you're in New York, you're selling out every night, and then you can't even like fill a bunch of people outside of the city. Right. So you know wh- how you know people are yelling free bird or whatever, and they don't know what to expect. Right. Did they stray anybody away, or like were people really into it at the time? Uh, well, there was always a small faction of, of kids. You know, we we kind of know uh, you know that that might be a decent night because there'd be at least at least if we saw ten kids with uh, you know and, and then some of them wearing a disco socks button or something like that, you know. We knew, uh, and they would be wearing motorcycle jackets, and uh, you know, as, as opposed to like uh, the disco clothes or something like that. Or uh, we knew that at least there was some hope um, that it, there would be some decent response. But um, and of course, you know, it, it was it was nice and it was rewarding to see as time went on these, you know six kids coming to the shows in, in places like Connecticut and Massachusetts, Rhode Island and, uh, you know, point south and or uh, even when we went west and, uh, you know, like the, the lumberjack country and, uh, you know, six kids next time there would be uh, 20 kids. And uh, and it was it was a rewarding to see that happening. Right. I'm sure it is. But initially it was scary. Okay. Yeah. I mean, it's uncharted waters because you know when. Really, I'm trying what to, the uh, reaction was going to be. You exactly. Because I'm trying to picture out how like middle America, you know, especially in the late '70s, would try and take to the Ramones. You know, around the time that the Sex Pistols first started and only toured America. You know, they only went to the places where they knew right. that th- they weren't going to get an audience and they would just go to piss people off. But the Ramones never intended on doing that. No. So they just wanted to get the music heard and you know play it out. I'm just trying to picture what it was like going to like I don't know, you know somewhere in you know, uh, Illinois or like Wyoming and playing. Right. Well, you have some, you have guys there that you know were real motorcycle guys, you know, and then here we are, these skinny kids from the Queens, wearing motorcycle jackets, and then I think sometimes you know they, you, you get the distinct impression these guys did not approve. You know, and uh, I don't know if maybe if one of their girlfriends talked to the band or something like that, they'd get very upset. You know. Gotcha. So you have so you have them on the road now and everything. But as before, they left obviously New York City. Um, there was the birth of the cool era, if you will, and the Lower East Side that you were a key figure of personally, and in the, uh, in the late seventies. What is your fond- fondest memory of, uh, you know, being at CBs or maybe not being at CBs, but being in that neighborhood at that time? Um, well, I guess the fond memories are just e- even uh, going from back and forth from CBGBs to Max's Kansas City to the Mud Club um, to places like that where there was always something new happening. And it was 
just such a uh, a, a vibrant energy about what was going on at, at that time and it was just tremendously exciting and, and um, the creativity was just flowing you know and uh, um, it was just remarkable to be part of that and uh, not knowing uh, what really how, how, how long how far this thing was going to go how far we could all we could take this thing and, and seeing it um, become an actual force you know an actual viable genre and you know now with cb shut down and i I know that's not one exact experience right i don't know if that's what you're looking for well no i I mean it could be you listen it's all it's all yours i mean if if i ever had a time machine you know i would love to go back and just witness a night there you know i see pictures today of you know you and joey and the rest of the guys hanging out with david bowie right right. one unforgettable night man is when i went to max's kansas city to see a band called suicide oh yeah okay right and opening up for suicide was a band called devo Oh, and nobody had ever heard of these guys before, right? And I didn't know what to expect, and I was just, uh, you know, I just remember like being so blown away. I mean, they did their whole show where they were, you know, stripped off their paper mache outfits and had these other things <laughs> underneath, and were doing these songs like Mongoloid, and uh, you know, it, I, I was just just blown away. And uh, that's just one uh, one little one of those occasions, I, you know, that's certainly. Uh, unforgettable. That's so awesome. And that happened, uh, you know, all the time with the B-52s, with, uh, you know, all these bands that were, uh, with the Dead Boys, all these bands that started coming uh, up to New York, you know, that you'd never heard of, but then they'd be opening up for some other band and, uh, and then, wow, holy shit, this band is better than the band they're opening <laughs> for, you know, it was, just, it, was, it was just great, you know. That's very awesome. Yeah. Because, I mean, you know, everything, of course, you know, all good things come to an end. You know, CB's has shut its doors. It's John Barbados now. But that avenue now is, is Joe, your own place, and it That's always right. will be. Yeah. Um, did you help orchestrate that? I certainly did. <laughs> I hope. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, me and my mom. Actually, the, the, the thing, the idea was started at the... Uh, the 50th, uh, Joey Ramone's 50th birthday bash, which, uh, you know, we had uh, held about a month after he passed away. It was his 50th birthday, and we, when he was in the hospital, he didn't know if he was going to make it, and he said, you know, you've got a promise, you're going to throw, I have this big party, whether I'm here or not, and we did, and then a young girl named Maureen, um, I can't pronounce her last name, is Wojciechowski, uh, I could find out for you if you need it, but she approached my mom, and said she wanted to uh, uh, start a movement uh, to um, to have a street named after Joey, and uh, we then we got involved with her, and we you know kept petitioning for the, 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 uh, the yeah because I signed the petition I remember that you did yeah, yeah. Um, right so we had our you know a bunch of people out there and then uh, then we we tried to take it a little further and contact um, the city council people personally and all that and. Uh, and the community board, um, and just kept, and you know, we kept going to the meetings and all that, and uh, and finally uh, got it to happen. 